We are reaching out to you with an exclusive edition of In Conversation brought to you by Daily Mirror. We're taking a moment to thank everyone who has been a part of this journey throughout and we want you to stay tuned for upcoming episodes as well. Today I have with me someone very special. She is gorgeous and has won the hearts of many around the world as a beauty queen and of course as a social activist. She brings the female voice to the forefront in the political arena and also serves as the Honourable Mayor right here in Colombo at the moment. I warmly welcome Rosie Senanayaka. Thank you, Hirushi, for inviting me to be on the program. You know, the pleasure was mine to even mm -hmm. uh, take a moment to actually invite you. Thank you so much for being a part of it. And uh, there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot happening around. There's so much creativity, energy, and uh, of course, we can dream. Mm -hmm. So before we look into the future, I would like to kind of backtrack a bit and uh, to see how is everything going. And I heard you're a grandma. Congratulations. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited yeah. about it. And I want to retire from everything that I do so that I could spend more time with my grandbaby. How, how do you manage your time, you know? You know, it's, it's so unfortunate. She's now almost eight months. She'll be eight months on the 28th. But, um, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, the new uh, normal, the lifestyle, um, I don't get to see her as much as I would love to get, you know, go and be with her because I have to, like, you know, do my work, interact with people. And then I would also, like, think about her safety. And, uh, yes, at least, uh, like, twice a week, three times a week. And then I was complaining to my son yesterday, I need to see my granddaughter. Please bring her home, you know. She, she could be like a good therapy session for you as well. <laughs> she is, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's like an unwinding uh, place, you know. You leave everything behind and when you go and, you know, see her smile, you know, try to talk or interact. And, you know, every day there are so many changes in her. I had forgotten, you know, what I went through with my three. And now it's like, you know, coming back to me again with her. So you get to relive it. In a very I'm really in it actually. Yeah, it's like a yeah. part-time thing, but yes. you get to really it. You know, it's it's a totally different thing from like having your own children and to see, you know, having you know, my friends who have had grandchildren have told me, Rose, you know, it's a, such a joy. It's totally a, a new experience and um, uh, it gives you, it rejuvenates you and you know, it does this for you and that for you. But until I actually experienced that, I really didn't understand what they were talking about. I'm very excited for your journey as a yes, grandmom as thank well. Thank you. And of thank course, you. Um, you have this fascinating story that even your granddaughter will one day look into it and she'll be super proud of you. So I, I really want to backtrack into mm -hmm. your childhood. You know, how was it also, like? I, I think I had a beautiful childhood. I had um, uh, two brothers, three sisters. Um, we, our parents were like, you know, uh, normal parents. And we had such a fabulous childhood because we grew up uh, outside Colombo, even though, you know, we were constantly in Colombo every weekend. Um, and uh, that childhood, you know, the experience that I've had in my life, I don't think my kids have had that uh, kind of lifestyle, you know. Uh, even when, when, when it's like a festive uh, season, whether it's Aurudu, Vesa, Christmas or Poson, uh, you know, what we experienced during our childhood, I don't think our kids have gone through that. So, yeah, I think it's, it's beautiful. It was it was a beautiful. Um, uh, I suppose that is what makes you grounded and makes you who you are. You know, your upbringing, 
uh, has a lot to play in how you contribute towards society. So Definitely. And I yes. think um, that is something that's very much needed, especially mm -hmm. in a very digitally driven society at Absolutely. the moment. I mean, the, the hands-on aspect has, is kind of diluting at the mm -hmm. moment. So I think it's something to really, uh, you know, take into your mind. And Yeah, you know, Hiroshi, actually, um, just two days ago, it was the world's Earth Day. And uh, we were, you know, basically launching on a tree planting program where we wanted to plant 100,000 trees before the end of the year. We started off with 3,000 and within the next couple of weeks we would go on to 15 and like that we would end up with 100,000. And also I have taken the initiative, this is something that we've been working on for the last two and a half years, to ban polythene in the city. And um, whilst I was making this speech, you know, I was basically reminiscing the past in how we lived with the polythene free um, world. It was such a recent thing. It's it's very recent in the last two decades, I suppose, you know, this has become like a uh, thing that where people can't live without. But um, so talking about my childhood, uh, I remember, you know, uh, you know, from my household, when people went to the market, we used to go to the polar. And it was this one pang malla that used to take in. Practically everything you bought was put into these little pang malla. Or even if you went to uh, the rice vendor or, you know, to the stores, everything was like, you know, a, a paper gotta. Yeah. You know, they used to make the paper gotta. Uh, and from it's back in trend though. <laughs> I hope it's back in trend because we're looking but at alternatives. <laughs> yes, we're looking at alternative yeah. uh, things, you know, biodegradable things uh, to substitute for the polythene. So, you know, I was, I was reminiscing my past and going back to, you know, how in, during our days, uh, how innovative, like you said, people were, where people would use raw material, you know, uh, biodegradable material uh, for your convenience. And um, yeah, so that was those those days were like, you know, beautiful. Definitely. And I think um, back then what we had so passively, you know, the food, the organic absolutely. food, the resources, absolutely. things that we had, you know, so passively. You grew things in your own yeah. home garden and, you know, yeah, absolutely. Now I think it's like, it has become like a very niche experience now because now, yes. you can see how people really want going it. Going back point. to organic. Um, yeah, now the yeah. pangmal is in our fashion statement. Yes, it's, it's absolutely, out there. absolutely. So I think it's, in either way, it's, it's nice to see them coming back in the yeah. cycle, you know, coming mm -hmm. back and materializing in society. So I, I would like to, I'm curious to know what, you know, growing up, you know, being in the humble grounds, you know, having a great time with your family, you move into the city later on. You know. mm -hmm. Where is your professional I actually begin? didn't move into the city as like, you know, straight from school. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, I was trained by the tea board and I, I had this uh, uh, opportunity to go as uh, uh, a, not an official to promote Ceylon tea to London. Was that so your first profession? I, yes, oh, that was okay. my first profession. After spending this incredible childhood, um, you when did you actually move into the city? Where did your profession Actually, my parents were from the city and my father was posted. Uh, he used to work for the River Valley Development Board. So he was posted uh, out station. So we basically at least once in two weeks uh, or once a week uh, when my brothers were playing rugger, you know, uh, they went to Anand when they were playing rugger, we used to come to watch their matches. So we were in and out of the city. But I actually from school, um, I did a stint while I was in school for the Non-Aligned Conference okay. as a very young teenager uh, for the tea board. Uh, and that experience is invaluable, you know, meeting all these heads of state, um, getting to, you know, see what was happening in, uh, at the Non-Aligned Conference uh, was a fabulous experience. And ironically, my husband Atula was also uh, doing something during the non-aligned because you know during the non-aligned the then government uh, basically got all the youth involved in various things. So I did uh, a stint with the tea board and uh, that's when I was basically picked, uh, handpicked by the tea board to go to London to do their promotional work. So then I came to the city for training and after the training period, I was I went to London straight away. So then I pursued my higher studies. So at this while point, working. you haven't ha met met your husband at this point. No, even though he was also <laughs> working, I hadn't met. But the two families knew each other very okay, well. Right. Yeah, but for so me, it's close enough. <laughs> it was close enough. Yes, I so, actually met him in England. That's amazing. So, um, so besides your journey to London, the global experience, you know, it it. it 
it's very much ornamented with your journey with Mrs. Mm -hmm. World as well. So was it at, around this time that you were, I mean, after marriage, of course. How so I, the, okay, I worked for the Ceylon Tea Board uh, in London um, for about three years, yes. almost four years. And my job was to travel on the continent, uh, promoting tea, uh, not just Europe. I, I've been to, you know, like the Pata Conference in the US. Uh, we've been to, uh, you know, some of the South American countries. Uh, I've been to Russia during the uh, Ol Olympics in 1981. Uh, so it, it was a constant traveling. And that experience for me, I suppose, was invaluable for my later years of life, you know, whether it was winning a title or perhaps getting into politics. Uh, all that so that that was one of those things that I would really cherish um, and then after th uh, the fourth year I came or the third year I can't remember exactly when I came on holiday okay. to Sri Lanka uh, when I came on holiday my friends basically forced me to take part in the Miss Sri Lanka which was on at the particular at that particular time and uh, for me, I was really not interested in the pageant. I was more interested in, you know, spending time with my friends, my family, to travel a little bit because I had just four weeks. So in that four weeks, I went for rehearsals, uh, took part in the pageant, won the Miss uh, Sri Lanka, and then I had to get back to work yes. to London. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year was the Miss World, which was in London, which was held at the Royal Albert Hall. So that was another experience, entering the Miss World, spending time with you know, almost 100 uh, young ladies from all over the world. Uh, that was fabulous. Took part in the Miss World. Then the year later, uh, the franchise holder of the Miss uh, World pageant in Sri Lanka was the Honorable Pro former Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe's father, Mr. Esmond Vikramasinghe, because they had the franchise for the Miss Universe and the Miss World because uh, they were part owners of the Lake House group. Well, the Vijayawadana family uh, owned it. Small world. Small world, it? small world. <laughs> so um, he was a franchise holder. So since I was reigning Miss Sri Lanka and I lived in England and I was at the Miss World, uh, the Miss Asia Pacific uh, was happening the next year in May. Uh, so they invited me. They nominated me to be the, you know, a candidate for the Miss Asia Pacific. So I was quite happy just to come back home again and travel to Malaysia because I was going via Sri Lanka and won that pageant, went back to England uh, and subsequently met my husband, um, married Atula, uh, came back so to... So it was like a aha moment, like you knew that this is it? <laughs> yes, it's one of those things when you meet somebody and it instantly tells you, okay, this is the person. Sometimes it might be, you know, a, a wrong feeling that you have, but for me it worked. It worked fine. Yeah, It's amazing to know that. Yes. And and uh, with, I also would like to know, um, you know, great things have happened within this period. And uh, was the ideal of beauty, was it different from now? Because it's been almost four decades since the pageants have evolved. Was it, was it any different from now? Was it this commercialized? I don't think, I don't, I, you know, the thing is today I see like so many pageants. Of course. Which we never saw. I mean, there was a few main pageants. There was the Miss World, the Miss Universe, uh, the Miss International. Miss International also came subsequently. The Miss Asia Pacific is pretty old. It, it is as old as uh, the Miss World. Uh, the Miss Young International. And those were like the few pageants that were there in the world. Uh, then came Miss Tourism. Nowadays Miss Global. Uh, and now, you know, at a drop of a hat, you can yeah. like, you know, there are, you know, anyone, even if I want to have a pageant, an international pageant today, I can go and just register myself, you know, call some people from overseas and uh, have a pageant. So, but still those conventional pageants that have been there for, uh, you know, 50, 60 years are recognized as the main uh, beauty pageants in the world. Definitely. Yeah. And, um, after you know finding your soulmate, you get to become Mrs. Sri Lanka World and yes. subsequently Mrs. World. Mrs. World. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I was not there to congratulate you, but now I want to say you're not even born. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yes. like, that's super exciting. So mm -hmm. I, I really like to know what were the highlights of, of this, you know, being the beauty queen and, and being um, a representative for Sri Lanka and subsequently winning. What was the experience? You know, even like? even the Mrs. Sri Lanka, I was really not very keen on taking part because I had just had my baby, my son. Uh, he was nine months actually when I took part in the oh. Mrs. World. Um, so back again, the franchise holder was 
uh, were the same people. Uh, Mr. Esmond Vikramasinghe was the franchise holder. And then here I think passed it on to his son, Niraj was sending the, the pageant. And um, they ran the pageant and they were looking for married women. And you know, all our friends, uh, just everybody was like in the pageant. And there was so much sisterhood. So fun. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> From Angela Seniviratna to Geraldine Bandar Naik to you know it was it was all friends and there was so much sisterhood. We never questioned each other's uh, issues like what is happening today. Uh, we would have supported each other uh, at any cost. Uh, it was actually fun. It was it was a lot it's of fun. It's all about having fun at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's fun. And also the experience that you gain by interacting and mix, mixing and mingling with uh, I mean, for me, they were all friends, uh, is what you take with you. You know, if I didn't win and if Angela won, I would have, you know, very happily all of us. I mean, they supported me to go for the Mrs. Uh, world and they were very happy when I won the Mrs. world. Uh, and we still remain friends, all of us, you know. Uh, so, yeah, even the Mrs. world is, um, was an experience to me um, because uh, David Marmel, the founder of Mrs. World. He actually founded, he and Elaine Marmel, this couple, founded the Mrs. America 10 years or 12 years prior to the Mrs. World. And uh, David is somebody who, who did a lot of productions. Uh, he was, he's the one who did the Victor Awards in the US. Um, if you Google David Marmel, you'll see, you know, exactly what, what kind of a personality he is and what he has done for the, uh, the, the, the arts and sports uh, in the US. Uh, he one day had this thought, he and Elaine had spoken about this and said, you know, there are pageants for single women and married women. But then he felt that, you know, married women, once they get married, especially young married women, and with that experience of having kids or, you know, uh, they mature uh, better. But there was no platform to showcase their talent. Uh, there was no platform to... Um, uh, give an opportunity to a married woman to, you know, basically come out there, uh, bring out her talents, her personality, and of course, an opportunity thereafter for her to forge into whether it's politics or in the field of arts, acting, of singing, Not you know. people think marriage is like the Absolutely. Yeah. So he got this bright idea of starting the Mrs. America pageant, giving an opportunity to a married woman, giving the platform for a married woman, to, uh, you know, uh, come and, you know, represent themselves. So he had the state pageants first in the 50 states and then they had the Mrs. America pageant. And then this was, this became very popular in America. Everybody was looking forward. It used to be aired by either ABC or NBC, I can't remember, one of those major networks. And uh, after 12 years of doing the Mrs. America, he decided to go global. And uh, then he started the Mrs. World pageant. And then he reached out to every franchise holder who had connections with the Miss World, the Miss Universe in those respective countries and asked them whether they would like to, you know, send a married woman. So that's when the Mrs. Sri Lanka happened here. And I happened to be the first uh, Mrs. World because I took part in the first ever Mrs. World pageant. Yes. Yes. First and first time yeah. we strike the gold. Yeah. And what were your key highlights, you know, being the title You know, the holder? thing is, when I went, I went, of course, um, there were no mobile phones, there That's were no like computers thinking, you know, yeah, and laptops. It was, not advanced. It, was, it was in the mid 80s. Uh, you know, I remember I had to leave 11 month old baby. It was heartbreaking for me to leave my son behind and go for the pageant. Uh, there was no Atula who has always been my support system. Uh, it took me about 36 hours to get to Honolulu because the Mrs. Sri Lanka pageant got a free air ticket from Korean Airlines. So I had to fly via Seoul. Uh, I was in the airport in Seoul for about, I've never spoken about these things. <laughs> and I'm just talking about, you know, uh, what you go through sometimes to, but yeah. once you win it, it's, I, I remember sitting in the Seoul airport for about 15 hours to get my connecting oh my flight to Honolulu. Uh, got to Honolulu. I spent five weeks because we were there for five weeks. Uh, it was a very exciting pageant. Uh, I had, I think, made only two trunk calls home because every time I made a trunk call, either, you know, uh, Atula and them were sleeping or oh, when they called me, I was, you know, either on one of the tours or ears, you know, whatever. 
So, um, it was a tedious affair. It was a tedious, but I never for a moment thought that I would win because I thought since this is the first ever Mrs. World, they'll want to, you know, basically move towards a very prominent country uh, to, you know, do propaganda and promotions. So, it was, it was a surprise. That's amazing. And, yeah. and so, for whoever is actually doubting, you know, or because I'm Sri Lankan or because I'm, I'm from a third world country, you know, different, there are different mm -hmm. ideologies woven around us and what we represent. So they don't really think or explore into global potential. So what kind of advice would you like to give for those who really like to strive for it? You know, the thing is, uh, it has helped me uh, in becoming who I am today. Uh, if I mean, some people look down on beauty patterns. Some people would, uh, I mean, every young girl thrives to become either an Aurudu Kumari in the village or, you know, enter one of the Miss Sri Lanka oh. pageants or once they're married, they, you know, basically strive to, you know, become uh, the Miss Sri Lanka. There's nothing wrong in it. It only gives you a platform because uh, right now and even in the past, uh, beauty pageants always had a purpose. And that purpose, because if you Google the number of beauty queens who have entered politics for that matter, you know, because I see some people criticizing, saying that how can beauty queens become politicians? What have they done? You will see from presidential candidates to uh, deputy presidents to uh, in the US, there are so many who have become senators uh, and, you know, mayors in the uh, Asian countries. Uh, uh, you know, people have basically move forward either they have you know basically become uh, top actors uh, in the world or you know some kind of artists or they have got a platform and the recognition uh, to champion the causes that they strongly believe in so to me it's a good thing but right now the kind of pageants that i see uh, that are happening in the country i don't know whether it's actually giving that platform to people so there is a question to look about into. and also um briefly looking into you stepping into leadership I, I i like to know what your journey has been like being a female politician does it come with uh, its own fair share of challenges being a female or is it oh, beyond yeah, gender? definitely oh it's beyond <laughs> it's beyond gender. no it, there's a fair share of uh, challenges i mean if one would ask me what were the biggest stumbling blocks for you to become who you are today i would say the biggest would be the mere fact that I'm a woman and number two also would be that I belong to the majority community but to a minority religion. See all these factors play, uh, have a uh, you know uh, effect on uh, who you are and of course uh, also the other challenge would be is that I didn't come from a political background. Okay. So these are because I've come through the rank and file and it's a lot of hard work and uh, there have been times when I have like questioned myself, why are you doing this? You know, what are you doing it for? And of course, I derive strength from other women because I've always been an activist. I've always, you know, I must say, uh, the Mrs. World uh, gave me the opportunity to travel around the country uh, and to meet with people from not only here, also overseas, uh, with people who were less fortunate, uh, people who were deprived of their basic rights, uh, with the underserved. So, uh, you know, that is when I wanted to you know, step in and try and make change uh, for women. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you basically come out there to help women, uh, you can be discouraged. I mean, that's a natural norm in this country. Yes. Anyone that is a threat is being constantly, you know, put down or there is character assassination to... The sensational practice. media yes. and But everything. you know, see, I, I actually derive strength from uh, people, uh, especially women who go through hardship. Now, say for an example, I keep wondering why would a woman want to leave her kids, her young daughters, her family, go overseas, and, you know, basically work under, I would say, I mean, some of them work like slaves, you know, under such hardships, difficult circumstances and uh, come back because they want to better their family. 
better their children's lifestyles, uh, to give them, you know, better opportunities, to give them better education, to give them a roof to live under. And when I see that woman striving to better her family, I keep thinking, what am I complaining about? You know, I should maybe step up and support her. When I see a female headed household, the single woman, whether it's in the north, the east or the central uh, or the south, uh, struggling as a single parent, uh, you know, with no livelihood, uh, they would do anything to, you know, basically sometimes they walk miles to get just clean drinking water. And I keep thinking, what am I doing to support? So I derive strength from women when I see the estate uh, women who are malnourished, their children are stunting, uh, wasting in growth, the children are malnourished. And when I see the numbers and the data, you know, I had the good fortune of becoming uh, the first ever and the only goodwill ambassador for the UN. I worked for UNFPF for a while until I got into direct active politics. And that also opened my eyes because as, as Mrs. World, I got the opportunity of becoming goodwill, the goodwill ambassador. I traveled around the country. And when I, you know, and the mandate of the UNFPA was to work on uh, reproductive health. And when I saw the issues that the youth are faced with, uh, whether it's uh, from unwanted pregnancies to uh, HIV and A, HIV and STD, um, STD and HIV uh, and AIDS, you know, you keep wondering, you have the privilege of going out there and making a change. What are you sitting here? and worrying about, you know, okay, this man is putting me down or that one is criticizing me. So all those barriers and challenges uh, means nothing at the end of the day, because I truly derive strength from people. Even in the city of Colombo, when I see the underserved, you know, people think that people outside, outside Colombo might think that the city of Colombo is such a flourishing, rich, where all the rich yeah. people, the affluent uh, lives. 60% of the city dwellers are the underserved settlement behind the flyovers and the skyscrapers. Absolutely, you know, and they live in the waters and uh, they have serious issues with regards to sanitation, clean drinking water, uh, housing, livelihoods and what the women go through. You know, so that gives me that strength to fight and forge forward in doing what I'm doing. So initially I had uh, so many, you know, I was known as just a pretty face. Desha Panda Sudhusune. Then uh, I had to prove myself and I must say at this point uh, I have to name Sirasa. Uh, you know because Sirasa gave me the opportunity to do the program called Jeevithi Ridhadenda and I had the good fortune of interviewing your two parents yes, who are brilliant doctors, <laughs> both are doctors. My mom is actually a homemaker and uh, my dad is also so, a doctor who is also yes. you know, very much into And the also advocacy. she's an artist, yes. she's a singer, they both can sing well. So you know that program made people realize that I was just not um, you know a, a title holder or a face. Uh, I, had I grew a lot up watching that show. Yes. <laughs> so you know relying. I used to basically bring issues that are pertaining uh, to, you know, relevant issues which women would suffer with, whether it's their legal matters, health issues, social issues, even like, you know, basically renting a house and uh, how do you rent a house? You know, how, what do you do? How cautious should you be? Uh, or lending money. Uh, also their legal issues, whether it's violence against women or, you know, s domestic uh, abuse, where do they go? So I used to bring resource people and, uh, you know, sometimes make them accountable, make them uh, respond to some of the questions, get people. So that was like also a platform that I used where people realized that, okay, you know, she had a little bit more to Bring being to just table. a title yeah. holder, uh, you know. so. It was, it was not easy, it was a lot of hard work and I also struggled with Singhala initially. Uh, then I sat down and I learnt the language. You know, I studied in Singhala but then after a while you forget all those, you know, high flown, uh, the jargon that politicians use because, you know, in the, in the legal <laughs> fraternity we use the legal <laughs> jargon, in politics you use the political jargon. But I had a good mentor, uh, Jayanta Rukmani Sirivadana. I have to mention her. I used to, I, Mama Mahanadu Pawake, I read 
<laughs> every possible single book that I needed to read from literature to biographies to whatever and whenever I came through a difficult uh, word or whatever I used to list them down and Jayantha used to sit and coach me so it was it wasn't easy I, I had to learn uh, how to become a, a better politician uh, how to uh, speak the language uh, how to you know um, uh, address the mindsets. Yes, yeah, so I think you have to be people centric. You need to basically be empathetic. Uh, you should be able to give a listening ear to understand people's issues and to be able to empathize with them. Uh, empathy is a key uh, issue in my opinion. Also, to have a very clear vision uh, and uh, resilience is something that you really need if when, when you are in politics. Uh, you know, people will thrash you for things that you haven't even done. I mean, I have faced a fair career. share of, uh, <laughs> yes, um, basically character assassination, which eventually hurts. I know it used to hurt my husband, uh, my family, my children. And uh, of course, at times like that, I do derive strength from God. And I say, okay, uh, you know, there are times when I keep asking myself, why am I doing this? It's hurting my family. Uh, but then again, when I look at the bigger picture and I see the woman out there or the child out there that's suffering and that they need support, they need help. Uh, so, you know, my, my um, I mean, if I'm to like, you know, encourage women, I think more women, women like you, um, Hiroshi, I must say, you all need to basically come out there and take on the role of leadership because you have the capacity you have uh, you know the strength and there are so many young people that i see today who's got the strength the capacity the sincerity and the commitment to go out there and make change but they shy away from coming out there and becoming politicians because politics have become something that is not uh, attractive for people to come and make change even for themselves it's generalized into something it's, that is it's generalized and politics has become I, I don't i don't really know what it has become uh, it has become something that you know people would like shy away and especially the uh, the, the intellect they feel that that's not for us that is maybe. definitely true we see the void of you know not having intellects and they feel yeah. like it's it's the best thing to do is just step back and watch everything happen yes but we need more people coming you and need people definitely absolutely and there are people who can empathize with people with their and you see these voices in the background you know uh, either they come out through social media or they come out to different uh, foras and you know they, they voice their opinions about you know what should be done and what should not be done but if you invite them to actually come and get involved in direct active politics they say no and I see a lot of women on the ground we have a very strong women's movement but you invite them to sit on a you know to get into politics uh, they say no that's not for me so it's very sad actually it used to be a very elite profession and it's, it's yep. still not too late for um, people to step Not in. at all, not yeah. at all. It is, it is not an elite profession. It's a profession for pra practically everyone at every strata. Um, if they're committed and if they want to make change in their villages, you know, they can come through the local council. And from there you can grow to be a provincial uh, member. And from there you can grow to be a national member. You know, so it's for everyone who is sincere, who is committed. Definitely. And I think we had a very nice discussion on covering on many areas. And before we wrap up, I just have a very quick bunch of questions I want to mm -hmm. ask you. This is going to be like very rapid ones. So, um, who is your all-time favorite style icon? Ramani Even Fernando. <laughs> In Sri Lanka? Anywhere. Yeah. Yes. I think in Sri Lanka, it's uh, definitely uh, Ramani Fernando. But internationally, I loved and I adored and to date, I love uh, Princess Diana. She is amazing. Yes. And if you were ever offered a role in leadership in another country, which you already have and done, uh, but if you were once again um, given a role in leadership to work long term in another country, which country is the closest to your heart? Uh, there are two countries that are very close to my heart. I spent a lot of time in my youth in England, so London. And I love Malaysia because I was High Commissioner there and I had such, clo uh, such a close bond uh, with the people of Malaysia that I would love to, you know, 
Yeah, definitely. And also, um, out of the array of social causes that you worked for, which cause is the closest to you? Like, the, something that you really genuinely want to make? So, there are, I mean, there are a couple of causes that I've been working uh, on and I have worked for. One is because um, seeing the female headed households and the number of pregnant mothers that are mal malnourished, uh, and also as a result of that, to see a very high number of low birth weight uh, at birth. Uh, rate um, to see children who are stunting and wasting and malnourished. Uh, so I worked on when I was I was only in the hundred day government minister for child affairs. I brought in this nutritional package of twenty thousand rupees for a pregnant mother. Uh, I also worked on because I strongly believe that uh, early childhood is of paramount importance for any human being. Uh, to become a healthy, strong uh, individual, intelli intelligent individual. And I believe in uh, building brains, building future, the concept that UNICEF has brought in. So for me, early childhood education and early childhood development uh, was of absolute importance. So I worked with the World Bank and I was able to get 50 million US dollars to work on the early childhood uh, education system. And I have been fighting with the then government. Even now I've been voicing this uh, through UNICEF and other uh, agencies to make uh, preschool education m mandatory for every child and to bring that into the free education system. The number, the other issue that I have worked on and personally uh, had a hand in, uh, this is the voice of all the women in the in the country, uh, voice of women who have worked tirelessly for years to increase the female representation uh, in politics. Uh, I was able as a member of uh, parliament to bring a, a private member motion to bring 30% of women into uh, the local government, uh, the local councils, uh, which was thrown out of parliament during that time. And then as soon as we came into power, uh, the Honorable Rani Vikramasinghe gave me the opportunity to work on with the uh, legal officer of the uh, local government ministry, Gayani Prema Tilaka, to create the formula. And today, as a result of that, uh, we have 25% of women uh, in the local councils. So for me, I feel that that's a personal achievement uh, that I was able to take. This is not a personal achievement single-handedly, I was able to take the work that women on the ground had done and I was able to be the voice and to be behind the scenes and push it through uh, the then government. So today we have 25% of women. I have many things like that that I can, you know, uh, talk about which I have done and also it's hardly can be it can mm -hmm. hardly be put into yes, exactly. question definitely and, so and I think it's amazing to see how you've created so many stepping stones for the female voice yeah. had to come to the forefront so that's amazing so there are a few that i'm doing right now uh, as mayor but you will see the results uh, at the end of my tenure definitely we're looking forward to um mm -hmm. you know following up on that as well and um a local political figure that you look up to in terms of you know nurturing your role as a politician it could be someone historical it could be someone who's you know currently in service there are many, many politicians that I look up to, especially if I'm talking about the females from Sirimao Bandar Naik, you know, to me, uh, in that day and age, uh, for Mrs. Bandar Naik, who was just the mother of the Prime Minister's kids and the wife of the Prime Minister, and uh, after the demise of her husband, when she was thrown in, to the political arena to take on that challenge. The way she conducted herself, uh, you know, I may not agree on some of the policies uh, and the ideologies, but for her to have become the first woman prime, uh, prime minister of the world, for her to have achieved some of the things that she has achieved, the relationships she forged, whether it was with India, China uh, and uh, various countries, for her to have had the non-aligned conference in Sri Lanka in 1996. So I, she's one of those politicians. Uh, there were many from Vimala Karnangara to also, I mean, there were many women. They were uh, not directly involved in politics, like the Women's Franchise Union that was formed in the late 1927, which uh, fought for universal suffrage. And uh, those were the women. Some of them were wives of people who were in politics. And they ridiculed their wives. 
you know, Hindi me came only kena katha. All these things of came course. came during that no, time. Not, yeah. But the women's franchise union fought, and we were able, women in this country, to be able to participate and vote long before some of the uh, regional countries, before India, Pakistan. Uh, I think even before England, uh, we had the right because we had very strong women in the past that fought for women's rights. And um, I see many women like that even today who are fighting for women's rights. I, uh, uh, I mean, if you're talking about in politics, uh, there are many uh, political women who have done various work in the past. Uh, and uh, if it's women, but if it's men, uh, somebody that I had always admired is Ram Singh Premadasa. But the work he did for the people at the grassroots uh, is something that even up to date people talk about. I have learned at a single inkyani, deshapani ayana ayani ganagani. If I learned my ABCs of politics, I learned it from uh, Mr. Premadasa and Mrs. Premadasa. Uh, gave me that opportunity to go with her and become a member of the Seva Vanita uh, unit. Uh, and I was a lifetime member. That's when I traveled around the country and saw the hardships that women went through. And I felt that I need to step up. Uh, I need to go out there and make that change. It's, it's amazing to see that inspiration yeah. finally manifests in social change. So all the very best with all the amazing things you do during your tenure and even beyond that. And uh, before we wrap up the discussion, um, I recall that you wanted to address, wanted, yes. address our yes. audience. You know, for me, the most important thing, I, apart from, you know, I mean, Hirish, it was lovely talking to you. It pleasure was, was it mine. was a pleasure <laughs> meeting you because I know your parents so well. Uh, they're fabulous uh, human they beings. We have done so much for the country. Well. But um, since your parents, you know, your father is a doctor as well. Uh, right now, with uh, the pandemic, you know, we are living a new normal uh, life. Life will never be the same. Uh, in the new normal, we need to be very cautious. You know, people are not taking the pandemic seriously. A mask, even though Hiroshi and I are having this social distancing and because of the interview, you're not wearing a mask. A mask is a must. Social distancing is a must. Washing your hands, sanitizing, you know, adhere to all the health guidelines and the norms. And right now, there is a danger of a third wave and with various variants. Uh, Colombo, we have been able to, I must say, the Colombo Public Health uh, Department uh, in the municipality, Dr. Vijay Muni and his team, we have done our very best to keep it under control, uh, to, you know, basically uh, we have from giving the vaccine to doing the PCR testing to doing advocacy with regards to, you know, asking people to be careful. We have done that in Colombo, but I'm asking the general public has a huge responsibility together with the government to make sure that this does not erupt into a dangerous third wave. We can curtail this, we can curb this only if the general public would support the government. So we have to be responsible for our families. Even when you go out, you know, I tell my, uh, my son, my daughter-in-law, you know, when you go out and come, don't even be eager to hug your baby. You know, and every time I meet someone, I always think of that person as a possible COVID patient. You know, this is how we should actually look at people at this point of time because until the entire country has received the vaccine and they're vaccinated, I don't think we need to take risks. So unnecessary functions, unnecessary movements, unnecessary going outs uh, is something that we need to be careful about and not have. So please help the system, please help the government, please help the health ministry, uh, you know, take the advice of the um, uh, health general secretary, take the advice of your local uh, PHI and try and refrain from, you know, moving around. Thank you so much for addressing the audience and take this responsibility into consideration mandatorily. And with that, we are wrapping up today's episode. Please do stay tuned for more.